everyone, my name is Jessica Nijalik. I am the newest uh, blogger and vlogger of Fashion No Boundaries as well as the newest content editor for their Facebook group. I just thought it would be appropriate to come on here and introduce myself to the community. I am, alongside being involved with Fashion No Boundaries, I am also a content writer for 12 other platforms, including The Mighty which is another platform that highlights disability, chronic illness, and chronic pain and other conditions that alter people's lives. I am also the founder and writer of the blog and it's on my community, The Abler, where I am also the social media manager, as well as a podcast host of the Many Faces of the Able podcast, linked to the blog and it's on my community. I am also an established and published poet, where I write various poetry on topics like romance, my disability, and prompt related pieces. I was recently brought on to the Fashion No Boundary platform as a new voice, and I cannot tell you how exciting that is, and I cannot wait to share my work with you guys. And I just wanted to come on here really fast and introduce myself. Um, as you know, today is day 19 of Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month. And 1 in 17 million people are affected with this most, this common, this most common childhood disability. I have hemiplegia cerebral palsy, which affects the left side, not the right side like I've written in my debut piece with the with Fashion No Boundary, that was an error on my part, and I didn't realize until after I published it. So, it affects my left side. I am a wheelchair user. I have been from the time I was four all the way up to now, which is the age of 36. Back in the early 80s when I was born, a lot of people didn't know a lot about um, premature birth. In fact, I was considered a micro preemie. I weighed only one pound and six ounces before my first surgery, which was a hernia surgery. After that surgery, I weighed one pound and nine ounces and stayed. I spent the three, the first three months of my life in the intensive NICU unit. I died three times and was brought back three times. I've had over 20 surgeries related to my CP, uh, everything from heel cord surgery to double hip surgery, and even eye surgery to correct my lazy eye. I have a pin on my heart that encloses the, the hole that was there during my premature birth. My stroke didn't happen af until after I was born and I missed the grace period. I was on Tegretol, which is a seizure medication, from the time I was 2 to 19. I do not have epilepsy. That's not the case for every person with cerebral palsy. I do have some learning disabilities like dyslexia and I have issues with math. Um, and of course, the high hand coordination and walking. I wear AFOs and am reliant on a wheelchair. I did try, you know, walkers and crutches. I am able to walk with a walker, but I haven't done that in years. Crutches was an attempt, but was not successful. That was when I was younger. Um, I did get um, OT and PT throughout my childhood and when I was in school. And then, of course, when you reach a certain age, the therapist basically tells you, you know, we've done all we can now. It's up to Jeff's. And, you know... Now that I'm an adult and things have shifted, I got a very rude awakening as far as the reality of actual services and actual help, especially when I graduated from high school in 2001. Um, I found out that you not only age the system then, but you age it multiple times throughout your adulthood. First, the school system, when you turn 17 or 18. Then, when you do get services, 
whether it be for employment or otherwise. And of course, you age out then because as soon as they give you a position, they don't tell you about the abandonment that you face. Because as soon as you get employment and you're settled and you get the green light, they're gone. They make all these promises. Oh yeah, we'll help you get full employment. Oh yes, we'll help you get this and that. Well, what they don't tell you is how incredibly broken the system is. I got my bathroom redone, which is the main bathroom in our home. We turned it into a wheel and shower. It was supposed to take three weeks. It took three months. At one point, we thought it was leaking. We called the state, the agency that we work with here at the time, and they're like, oh no, we really can't do anything. Unfortunately, fortunately for my dad found out it wasn't the shower itself. It was the shower head, so we just replaced it. But the plumbing has been screwed up since the installment, and that was how many years ago? Um, they redid my my van at the time, which they did a beautiful job. But the guy that even was doing it said, look, it's 15 years old. It's not going to hold out. Well, come and find out he was correct. They don't support. My services here doesn't support buying a brand new van. They just fix what the present, whatever equipment you have. They work with that, whatever you have, and that's it. They don't buy new things. So while it was beautiful, I ended up we ended up having to sell it because it no longer ran. And we spent more money, you know, replacing battery, car batteries than we did anything else. And then I got to the point where it stalled. Um 20 some odd years ago, online school wasn't that big. There weren't as many options as there are now for educational educations and online degrees and things like that, certifications. So when I wanted to go over to college, I was told, oh, well, you wouldn't be able to because of SATs. I never took the SATs because I have weak math skills. Okay. Come to find out, you can go to a community college and switch over to a four-year after the two-year program. Well, I did that for a semester, but then the continuing course I wanted to take was dropped because not enough people joined. And I told my parents, I just don't want to take classes just to take them. So, that was that. And this... Connecting with the state services took about seven years. The first seven years I was out of high school. Because every time I got to introduce someone or introduce myself to them, they got transferred or to over to a new apartment. Then when I finally did get someone in a position, I after four years at the position, and I had nothing to do with my employment or the staff there or anything like that. I had to leave it because I didn't have transportation. And my father at the time, he was working serious hours and it was interrupting his schedule because a month after I arrived at the appointment, that job, they switched the hours on the job. And yes, I know people are gonna say, well, why don't you use services like my ride or any, I've done that in the past. You know, you have to wait two and a half hours for a ride. They literally put that in there. So if I'm at a doctor's appointment or I'm at a, you know, job interview, you know, might not say two and a half hours. And now they've cut the services. So all the, all the areas that they could cover back then, they probably can't now because of cuts. So. 
So, this is another reason why I'm so passionate about my work. Because I originally started the Abler, my blog, in its own like community, for my sister, who was diagnosed nine years ago with a very serious neurological disorder or disease called cluster headaches. Now, cluster headaches are often mis misinterpreted as a simple headache because the word headache is in the condition. That is not the truth. They're also mistaken for migraines. Now, my sister is also a chronic migraine sufferer. So, the difference between a cluster attack and a migraine is that the clusters affect and attack nerves in the face that control feeling in the face. And they come in cycles. And she has about six attacks a day. She is limited to how far she can drive because she can't drive far, too far out because she's afraid of a cluster attack coming when she drives and cluster attacks affect her vision. So because it's an invisible disability, she was getting a lot of like, well, you look fine. It shouldn't be, what's wrong with you? Maybe you should see a shrink. Now, I understand about judgments and assumptions because I too, obviously, have a disability. The most common question I get from people most of the time is, was it a car accident? And I have to say, no, it was, I have cerebral palsy. And then they would probably was something like, oh, and then the conversation stops. You know, there's still so much we don't know about each other's known issues and backgrounds. And with social media as big as it is today, we post everything. Now, compared to 20 years ago when we were told younger, you know, it's none of our business, don't say anything, it's rude. But we need to have a conversation now because there's still plenty of people that don't, don't, don't know enough about known conditions like cerebral palsy, fibromyalgia, MS, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, mental illness, bipolar, depression, anxiety, multiple personality disorders. There's all these things that have so much stigma and assumption and wrong information because it's based off of an assumption when we think, oh, well, they're stupid. Oh, well, they're sick. Oh, well, they're crazy. Oh, well, they're hormonal. Oh, well, they're a woman. You know, they thought people would, that were exhibiting symptoms of MS were crazy until they come up, came up with the MR machine. MIR, M, excuse me, M, MRI machine. So, you know. And chronic fatigue syndrome isn't just a condition that makes you tired. It can really affect the body and then, and then, and you know, the person's speech, if it's a severe enough case, they can be bedridden for years, unable to use your body, unable to, you know, take in light or sound, unable to eat. So it was my goal with the Abler to bring light to all conditions, not just, you know, disabilities, invisible disabilities, you know, or just the typical standard things. I wanted to bring light to everything, from body image to eating disorders to addictions to the several different types of abuse. Um, so that was, this has been my goal since I started almost three years ago in July. Since then, I have completed over a dozen topics 
and I just completed research on my most current topic, which will be out in April, is the topic of DID, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder. So that's coming out. I've completed over a dozen interviews from the all on the topics of addiction to healthy body image to PCOS. So no topic is left abandoned in my book. We need to start discussing it. We need to have it start discussing, but not only discussing, but having proaction behind it. It's time to act inclusive. If we want inclusion, we have to act. Get a seat at the table. And even if you're not acknowledged at the table, we come back every single day until you are. They can't ignore you if you're loud enough. And by loud, I don't mean white noise. I don't mean by a simple march. I don't mean by all these things like we're talking about ableism and, you know, changing terms because it's offensive. Look, it's not the term. It's how you approach it. It's the tone you're giving it. I don't mind be calling, being called inspirational. You know, if you find it, you know, demeaning in some way, then tell the person, you know, your tone. You may not realize it, but, you know, I am an adult, and that's kind of childlike to approach it that way. Could you please? You know? But no, we would rather react to it than acknowledge it and try to attempt to teach someone how to fix it. Because, I guess what? People don't know unless you tell them. Now, if they're still asking questions and you give them the answers to the best of your ability and they choose to, you know, dismiss you and be rude about it, then that's what I call chosen ignorance. That right there is what I'm talking about. That's a big difference. Because you can't force someone to understand what they don't want to acknowledge. You just can't. But you can put your best foot forward and make your best attempts at putting action behind your conversation. Lead by example. We're so afraid to offend somebody now that it's easier to follow somebody into absolute absurd, you know, behavior, whether we think about it or not. That's what we're doing. And that's what happened with me. I got so fed up with the answers my sister, the comments my sister was getting, and then I realized, you know, this isn't just about invisible conditions or illnesses or topics that we don't want to talk about. This is everyday life. Everybody goes through this. And unless it affects them directly, you won't hear them agreeing with you. But what I was most shocked by was the lack of empathy and compassion. I mean, here we are in 2019, and I was just being told, literally, she's crazy. You know? That doesn't fly. I'm sorry. My sister, you know, She's not one to overreact, and when she's in pain, there's tears coming down her up. And she's crying hysterically because she doesn't know what to do. She's tried over a dozen med med medications. And yes, with this condition, there are medications that do help it, and there are things like oxygen therapy. She's tried it. It doesn't work. I don't knock what works for other people, but we have this stance on if, if a disability, whether it's an illness or chronic pain, then it's a one size fit all solution for anybody struggling with anything. That's not the case here.
has never been the case because we're not all the same. And as we get older and we're dealing with all these chronic issues, our needs are going to change. And the system that's supposed to recognize that doesn't, or it has a subpar recognition level that says, as long as it fits ADA compliance and we stick a handicap sign on it, it's fantastic. We're more concerned about what the handicap sign looks like, so we have to totally redo, redesign a national symbol because we don't think it's being represented enough or appropriately. Look, that's not what my concern is. My concern is that people that represent, represent that sign are being acknowledged, we're being dismissed, we're being put on waiting lists, we're being said that we're not disabled enough or we don't qualify for this or we're too independent for that or we're not, you know, essentially vegetables. Or if or somebody with a disability and more married, well, you can rely on your spouse's income. Do you know that there's a marriage equality law? There's a marriage penalty law for people with disabilities? That if a person marries his, their spouse or partner, whether or not that spouse or partner has a disability, they lose any benefits they have, if not garnished completely. And that means any medical assistance, any kind of services, any kind of aids or nurses, medical equipment, all that goes away. And we're lucky to get maybe a third. And I'm just guessing here, but I don't think you get anything. Because their stance is, well, if you have a spouse versus somebody that's single with a disability living on their own, you can make it better if you have somebody with you. Well, what if my spouse lost his job? What if he got injured on the job? And we don't qualify for stu food stamps because our whatever is too high. What if our rent gets put up three times higher than we're on? used to paying them, we've had to, you know. These are things that people deal with on a daily basis, but for somebody with a disability, it's more extreme because we were working with limited funds as is, not just from the state, but from what we have around us. We're trying to survive in a world that is not adaptable to us. No matter how many, you know, ADA laws there are, no matter how many, you know, requirements it barely meets, no matter how many signs we put up to acknowledge, you know, you're here, we get it. But that's all you're really saying because you don't follow through. The ADA law was founded in the early 90s, and yet here we are in 2019 and people are still getting discriminated against and not hired for jobs, or they, they're the first ones to get cut after being on the job for 20 years. And now social media wants to jump in and check us out, see how disabled we are, and make that kind of judgment call based off of our profile and our socialization on it. Seriously? Okay. Anyway, guys, that is my tale. That is what I wanted to share with you. I will be writing up another blog post in the future for you guys. Hopefully after the Easter holiday. I know that's a little later than usual. But, um, I have a topic that I wanted to discuss that recently came out. Um, related to the show Dr. Phil. And I guess that he had that was quadriplegic, quadriplegic, excuse me, I think I can say in the right, what was wheelchair, oh, newfound wheelchair user because of an accident, and his girlfriend was on. And Dr. Phil said, 
something of the fact that you can't be a caregiver and a someone who loves your partner at the same time. I'm sure you've all seen that quote on social media by now. I've seen it everywhere on Instagram. So that's going to be my next blog post for you guys. And I want to thank again everybody for letting me in and joining on this conversation and community. I'm so excited to work with everyone and get to know everyone better. 